Okay, let's do a stop. Yes. This one? Oh, okay, this one. No, this one. Uh, no, that's probably no. This one. No, you have way too many browsers open. No, no. Way too many. No. What happened? Right, that one. Right. <sighs> Okay, Takashi, and uh, just not your TV or something. Okay, let's start. Right. What? So we completed that video, right? Mm -hmm. How's going to fix it? It's too slow. <coughs> Uh, what? What did you do that? <laughs> <coughs> but it's still rather small, eh? Yeah. I think there is a. Speaker notes, view, full screen. Not too much now. No. Why not full screen? Oh, because I thought uh, you full screen is okay. Yeah. Why not? All right. Then it's just prison. Right. Okay. <coughs> All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. This is uh, uh, June twenty third. Um, joined by Takahashi from Southeast Asia, uh, Kimoto San, Uno San, and yours truly uh, from Tokyo. Uh, before I get started again, my apologies for last Monday uh, for forgetting about the. Oh, did uh, you call him? Yes, well, I, 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 we had a brief... Uh, Here, uh, I waited for 30 minutes. Moshi wa gozaimasu in this stuff. What we are doing is we are talk, looking at European history. Uh, we're aiming to go uh, into um, a, basically a response to Unosan's book about uh, Confucianism and the role of Confucianism in um, Japan and Japanese culture and uh, reflect that with European culture and look at similarities, differences, um, uh, where, where can we see that, that basically Japanese culture and uh, European culture has overlapped and uh, where are the major differences um, also looking at maybe as, as a comment an outsider comment on Japanese culture, uh, certain elements uh, in Confucianism that may not really be still visible today. Um, that is uh, hopefully starting next week, but we have a, we have a lot on our plate. Uh, we we started from Greece period, Greek period, the Roman uh, period. Uh, we went through the uh, Middle Ages. Um, and then uh, moved <coughs> on um, to the re uh, Renaissance, Renaissance Enlightenment and uh, we looked at the uh, video about the first industrial revolution in the UK um, what were the the backgrounds of, uh, behind the, uh, uh, 
the industrial revolution. It's not just simply the fact that there was cold. There was a, there was a, uh, actually a, a lot of elements that uh, made the, the first industrial revolution happen. In England, uh, the political factors, um, the, the, the way that um, the, 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 the British um, uh, were involved in colonialism, uh, the way that they basically invented uh, marketing and uh, consumerism. Um, all these things they they work together to create the first the first industrial revolution um, the, uh, the colonialism uh, capital flows so there were a lot of elements there that uh, all together made the first industrial revolution happen in the UK um, today we're going to look at uh, colonialism uh, which played an important part in European history uh, their exposure to uh, developing uh, the, to uh, uh, countries throughout the world uh, as colonial colonial uh, colonialists um, look at the role of Christianity uh, very important uh, political uh, political role but also uh, plays a very important role in European history if you don't know anything about religious history you don't probably don't understand European history uh, we look at World War uh, one can you check screen sharing? Ah, you are not viewing this. One moment, please. Uh, escape button. Hmm? Escape button. Hello. Oh, sorry. Spinning beach ball of death. One moment. Here we go. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, cannot. <laughs> that doesn't no cannot. Ah, here we go. No, this one. No, I no, think no, this, this one. one. No, no, this one. Really? Yeah, change system change. Oh, okay. Keep this. Ah. No, no, no. What did you yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Can you see ah. it? Yeah, yeah. All right, but I'm not sure whether you can also see. Wow. Can you still see it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm, 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 go I'm going to present this. Let's see if you can still see it. Mm -hmm. uh, present. Mara, okay. 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 okay, okay. Uh, look at World War One, World War Two, and um, basically the the aftermath of World War Two. Uh, more specifically, the Marshall Plan, Cold War, and the student movement in the <coughs> 1960s. And I think that if we have gone through all these steps, we have quite a good background into European history. Um, but first, look at colonialism. Uh, we ask ourselves a few questions here. Uh, why Europe? Why did Europe engage in colonialism? Uh, history of war. We look at industrialization, uh, disease, uh, the, run, the 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 role of guns, armed ships, uh, political incentives, like budget, uh, economic interest, and religious interest. They all played a role in uh, the question why colonialism. And uh, uh, first, we'll look at a video about colonialization, and then about decolonialization. Let's start with colonialization. To fly a rocket ship, you need to be an optimist. No astronaut launches for space with their fingers. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to discuss 19th century imperialism. So the 19th century certainly didn't invent the empire, but it did take it to new heights, by which we mean lows. Or possibly heights. I don't know, I can't decide. Roll the intro while I think about it. <laughs> Mm. 
Yeah, I don't know. I'm still undecided. Let's begin with China. When last we checked in, China was a thriving manufacturing power, about to be overtaken by Europe, but still heavily involved in world trade, especially as an importer of silver from the Spanish Empire. Europeans had to use silver because they didn't really produce anything else the Chinese wanted, and that state of affairs continued through the 18th century. For example, in 1793, the McCartney mission tried to get better trade conditions with China and was a total failure. Here's the Qianlong Emperor's well-known response to the British. Hitherto, all European nations, including your own country's barbarian and merchants have carried on their trade with our celestial empire at Canton. Such has been the procedure for many years. Although our celestial empire possesses all things in prolific abundance and lacks no product within its own borders. But then Europeans, especially the British, found something that the Chinese would buy. Opium. By the 1830s, British free trade policy unleashed a flood of opium in China, which threatened China's favorable balance of trade. It also created a lot of drug addicts. And then in 1839, the Chinese responded to what they saw as these unfair trade practices with a stern letter that they never actually sent. Commissioner Lin Zhexu drafted a response that contained a memorable threat to cut off trade in rhubarb, silk, and tea, all valuable products of ours without which foreigners could not live. But even if the British had received this terrifying threat to their <coughs> precious rhubarb supply, they probably wouldn't have responded because selling drugs is super lucrative. So the Chinese made like tea partiers confiscating a bunch of British opium and chucking it into the sea. And then the British responded to this by demanding compensation and access to Chinese territory territory where they could carry out their trade. And then the Chinese were like, man, that seems a little bit harsh, whereupon the British sent in gunships opening trade with Canton by force. Chinese General Yi Chen made a counterattack in 1842 that included a detailed plan to catapult flaming monkeys onto British ships. Stan, is that true? Alright, apparently the plans actually involved strapping fireworks to monkeys' backs and were never carried out, but still. Slightly off topic, obviously I don't want anyone to light monkeys on fire. I'm just saying that flaming monkeys lend themselves to a lot of great band names. Like the sizzling simians, burning bonobos, immolated marmoset. Stan, sometimes I feel like I should give up teaching world history and just become a band name generator. That's my real gift. Anyway, due to lack of monkey fireworks, the Chinese counterattacks were unsuccessful, and they eventually signed the Treaty of Nanjing, which stated that Britain got Hong Kong and five other treaty ports, as well as the equivalent of two billion dollars in cash. Also, the Chinese basically gave up all sovereignty to European spheres of influence, wherein Europeans were subject to their laws, not Chinese laws. In exchange exchange for all of this, China got a hot slice of nothing. You might think the result of this war would be a shift in the balance of trade in Britain's favor, but that wasn't immediately the case. In fact, the British were importing so much tea from China that the trade deficit actually rose more than $30 billion. But eventually, after another war and one of the most destructive civil rebellions in Chinese and possibly world history, the Taiping Rebellion, the situation was reversed and Europeans, especially the British, became the dominant economic power in China. Okay, so but when we think about 19th century imperialism, we usually think about the way that Europe turned Africa from this into this. The so-called scramble for Africa. Speaking of scrambles in the European colonization of Africa, you know what they say, sometimes to make an omelet you gotta break a few eggs. And then sometimes you break a lot of eggs and you don't get an omelet. Europeans had been involved in Africa since the 16th century when the Portuguese used their cannons to take control of cities on coast to set up their trading post empire. But in the second half of the 19th century, Europe suddenly and spectacularly succeeded at colonizing basically all of Africa. Why? Well, the biggest reason that Europeans were able to extend their grasp over so much of the world was the same reason they wanted to do so in the first place, industrialization. Nationalism played its part, of course. European states saw it as a real bonus to be able to say that they had colonies, so much so that a children's rhyme in an ABC for baby patriots went, C is for colonies, rightly we boast, that of all the great countries, Great Britain, has the most. But it was mostly, not to get all Marxist on you or anything, about controlling the means of production. Europeans wanted colonies to secure sources of raw materials, especially cotton, copper, iron, and rubber, that were used to fuel their growing industrial economies. And in addition to providing the motive for imperialism, European industrialization also provided the means. Europeans didn't fail to take over territory in Africa until the late 19th century because they didn't want to. They failed because they couldn't. This was mostly due to disease. Unlike in the Americas, Africans weren't devastated by diseases like smallpox because they'd had smallpox for centuries and were just as immune to it as Europeans were. Not only that, but Africa had diseases of its own, including yellow fever, malaria, and sleeping <coughs> sickness, all of which killed Europeans in staggering numbers. Also, Nagana was a disease endemic to Africa that killed horses, which made it difficult for Europeans to take advantage of African grasslands and also difficult for them to get inland because their horses would die as they tried to carry stuff. Also, while in the 
the 16th century Europeans did have guns, they were pretty useless, especially without horses, so most fighting was done the old-fashioned way, with swords. That worked pretty well in the Americas, unless you were the Incas or the Aztecs, but it didn't work in Africa, because the Africans also had swords, and spears, and axes. So as much as they might have wanted to colonize Africa in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, Africa's mosquitoes, microbes, and people were too much for them. So what made the difference? Technology. First, steamships made it possible for Europeans to travel inland, bringing supplies and personnel via Africa's navigable rivers. No horses? No problem. Even more important was quinine medicine, sometimes in the form of tonic water mixed into refreshing, quintessentially British gin and tonics. Quinine isn't as effective as modern anti-malarial medication, and it doesn't cure the disease, but it does help moderate its effects. But of course, the most important technology that enabled <coughs> Europeans to dominate Africa was guns. By the 19th century, European gun technology had improved dramatically, especially with the introduction of the Maxim machine gun, which allowed Europeans to wipe out Africans in battle after battle. Of course, machine guns were effective when wielded by Africans too, but Africans had fewer of them. Oh, it's time for the open letter? And my chair is back! An open letter to Hiram Maxim. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. Oh, it's Darth Vader! What a great reminder of imperialism. Dear Hiram Maxim, I hate you. It's not so much that you invented the Maxim machine gun, although obviously that's a little bit problematic, or even that you look like the poor man's Colonel Sanders. First off, you're a possible bigamist. I have a long-standing opposition to bigamy. Secondly, you were born an American, but then became a Brit, thereby metaphorically machine gunning our founding fathers. But most importantly, among your many inventions was the successful amusement park ride, the Captive Flying Machine. Mr. Maxim, I hate the Captive Flying Machine. The Cap the captive flying machine has resulted in many a girlfriend telling me that I'm a coward. I'm not a coward, I just don't want to die up there! It's all your fault, Hiram Maxim, and nobody believes your story about the light bulb. Best wishes, John Green. Alright, so here is something that often gets overlooked. European imperialism involved a lot of fighting and a lot of dying. And when we say that Europe came to dominate Africa, for the most part, that domination came through wars, which killed lots of Africans and also lots of Europeans, although most of them died from disease. It's very, very important to remember that Africans did not meekly acquiesce to European hegemony. They resisted, often violently, but ultimately they were defeated by a technologically superior enemy. In this respect, they were a lot like the Chinese and also the Indians and the Vietnamese, and you get the picture. So by the end of the 19th century, most of Africa and much of Asia had been colonized by European powers. I mean, even Belgium got in on it, and they weren't even a country at the beginning of the 19th century. I mean, Belgium has enjoyed like 12 years of sovereignty in the last three millennia. Notable exceptions include Japan, which was happily pursuing its own imperialism, Thailand, Iran, and of course Afghanistan, because no one can conquer Afghanistan unless you are, wait for it, the Mongols. <laughs> It's tempting to imagine Europe ruling their colonies with the proverbial topaz fist, and while there was always the threat of violence, the truth is a lot more complicated. Let's go to the thought bubble. In most cases, Europeans ruled their colonies with the help of, and sometimes completely through, intermediaries and collaborators. For example, in the 1890s in India, there were fewer than 1,000 British administrators supposedly ruling over 300 million Indians. The vast majority of British troops at any given time in India, more than two-thirds, were in fact Indians under the command of British officers. Because of their small numbers relative to local populations, most European colonizers resorted to indirect rule, relying on the governments that were already there, but exerting control over their leaders. Frederick Lugard, who was Britain's head honcho in Nigeria for a time, called this rule through and by the natives. This worked particularly well with British administrators, who were primarily middle-class men, but had aristocratic pretensions, and were often pleased to associate with the highest echelons of Indian or African society. Now, this isn't to say that indigenous rulers were simply puppets, often they retained real power. This was certainly true in India, where more than a third of the territory was ruled by Indian princes. The French protectorates of Morocco and Tunisia were ruled by Arab monarchs, and the French also ruled through native kings in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. For the most part, Europeans could almost always rely on their superior military technology to coerce local rulers into doing what the Europeans wanted, and they could replace native officials with Europeans if they had to, but in general, they preferred to rule indirectly. It was easier and cheaper 
Also, Westmoreland. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So while we can't know why all native princes who ruled in the context of European imperialism put up with it, we can make some pretty good guesses. First of all, they were still rulers. They got to keep their prestige and their fancy hats and to some extent their power. Many were also able to gain advantages through their service, like access to European education for themselves and for their children. Mahatma Gandhi, for instance, was the son of an Indian high official, which made it possible for him to study law in England. And we can't overlook the sheer practicality of it. The alternative was to resist, and that usually didn't work out well. I'm reminded of the famous couplet, Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. But even with this enormous technological advantage, it wasn't always easy. For example, it took 25 years from 1845 to 1870 for the British to fully defeat the Maori on New Zealand because the Maori were kick-ass fighters who had mastered musketry and defensive warfare. And I will remind you, it is not cursing if you're talking about donkeys. In fact, it took them being outnumbered three to one with the arrival of 750,000 settlers for the Maori to finally capitulate. And I will remind you that the rule against splitting infinitives is not an actual rule. Those of you more familiar with US history might notice a parallel between the Maori and some of the Native American tribes like the Apaches and the Lakota, a good reminder that the United States did some imperial expansion of its own as part of its nationalizing project in the 19th century. But back to Africa, sometimes African rulers were so good at adapting European technology that they were able to successfully resist imperialism. Ethiopia's Menelik II defeated the Italians in battle, securing not just independence but an empire of his own. But embracing European-style modernization could also be problematic as Hadiv Ismail of Egypt found out during his rule in the late 19th century. He celebrated his imperial success by commissioning an opera, Giuseppe Verdi's Aida, for the opening of the Cairo Opera House in 1871. Giuseppe Verdi, by the way, no relation to John Green. And Ismail had ambitions of extending Egypt's control up the Nile west toward Lake Chad, but to do that he needed money, and that's where he got into trouble. His borrowing bankrupted Egypt and led to Britain's taking control over the country's finances and its shares in the Suez Canal that Ismail had built with French engineers and French capital in 1869. The British sent in 1,300 bureaucrats to fix Egypt's finances, an invasion of red tape that led to a nationalist uprising, which brought on a full-scale British intervention after 1881 in order to protect British interests. This business imperialism as it is sometimes known, is really at the heart of the imperialistic impulse. Industrialized nations push economic integration upon developing nations and then extract value from those developing nations just as you would from a mine or a field you owned. And here we see political history and economic history coming together again. As Western corporations grew in the latter part of the 19th century, their influence grew as well, both in their home countries and in the lands where they were invested. But ultimately, whether the colonizer is a business enterprise or a political one, the complicated legacy of imperialism survives. It's why your bananas are cheap, why your call centers are Indian, why your chocolate comes from Africa, and why everything else comes from China. These imperialistic adventures may have only lasted a century, but it was the century in which the world as we know it today began to take shape. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is produced in Dr mm. This was good. <coughs> Okay, so actually he discusses a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, factors that yeah. contributed to uh, European uh, colonialism. Um, it was not something that uh, started in the nineteen nineties, uh, the the nineteen hundreds, but uh, uh, it actually started to to take off uh, once industrialization started to, to take off. Uh, mechanization enabled, uh, for example, people to get really inland. I mean, before that, uh, people, uh, the Europeans were not capable, for example, of colonializing Africa because uh, uh, they didn't have the means and, and they didn't, they, uh, they they were not resistant to the diseases. So it was very difficult to yeah. get inside Africa. Um, so <coughs> they they needed something like of a breakthrough and that, that came in the shape of a, of a steamship and uh, um, also Do uh, they need a uh, mineral, right? Yes, resources. Resources is, is a very important driver uh, for colonialism but also behind World War II as we will see. I mean that was one of the major reasons why World War II happened. Uh, access major reasons resources. for colonialization is they are uh, looking for mineral resources. Right, but not only minerals, also food. Uh, food? Food. Food. Uh, eating food? Well, uh, yeah, for e eating food. Uh, like, take, take for example, uh, why did Japan go to Manchuria? I mean, 
that was basically because there were too many Japanese in a, in a small country and they needed farmland and th therefore they uh, they started to develop Manchuria um, food resources in all kinds of shapes and forms um, another uh, important element was of, of, of colonialization uh, was economic colonialization um, uh, a very common strategy uh, economic integration with the colonialized power and then waiting for their uh, weaker economies to collapse and then take control over their national resources that happened a lot of course we if you look at the map today if you look at the world around us that you will see that most of the countries that have most of the resources actually are the poorest countries in the world why because basically they have been become uh, fallen victim to uh, colonialist powers who actually took control over all their natural resources and, and kept, kept the countries uh, under control through a um, uh, strategy of divide and rule, uh, which usually means that uh, the uh, imperialist power uh, actually uh, collaborates with local leaders, um, Preferably the minority uh, leaders, not the majority, but the minority, the, the fewer people uh, that uh, you can, you need to keep under control as an imperial country, the cheaper it is, the more effective it is. That's why you see all kinds of conflicts still today, like the Hutus and the Tutsis, um, is a conflict that was basically born uh, out of an imperial history where the, the, the Tutsis were actually collaborating with the imperialist power and um, uh, put in positions uh, that they held on to after the country became independent, which led to an uprising because the majority, um, the majority uh, uh, Hutus uh, did not uh, go for that. I oh, mean, they did not. Congo? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Rwanda. Rwanda. Uh, but the same thing is true in Nigeria, for example, and and in in a lot of other countries um, where. Uh, 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 well, for example, in, it will take Indonesia f f from the Netherlands. The, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, friction between the Chinese, uh, who w worked closely with uh, the, uh, the the Dutch, as well as the Moloka, the Moloka people. Uh, they also they were fierce warriors, and and uh, they were fighting along with the Dutch to keep Indonesia under control. Um, uh, but when the Dutch left, basically they uh, they had a lot of enemies. So that 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 kind of internal conflict that was created and and actually nurtured to keep uh, to keep these countries under control, basically stabilizing the, destabilizing them at the core. Um, <coughs> oh, Edison, I have a question. Hmm. Uh, I think there is a two types of the colonialism. It's colonialism. Right. Uh, one is uh, before. Uh, Industrial revolution. Mm. The other is uh, after industrial revolution. Mm. Uh, before industrial revolution, typically uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Right. Uh, and after industrial revolution, uh, the typically uh, England. I think uh, there's a, a big difference uh, because uh, uh, former type uh, Spanish and Portuguese use many many uh, human resources export to uh, Africa to uh, South America. Yes. And but. England don't export uh, uh, Africa to uh, South uh, America. Hmm. How about the British? Uh, yeah, no, I definitely mm. agree. And don't forget the yeah. French. They also mm. had a very, uh, very sizable uh, colonial uh, empire. Mm. Uh, not not only French, in uh. in uh, in West Africa, mm. but also in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Uh, so their influence mm. th th that stretched very far. Uh, and a lot of it, like uh, I, I remember <coughs> when we talked about Indochina, there, there were only about 15,000 French in the entire Indochina. Wow. Uh, the, he said there were, the, the, in India, there were only a thousand administrative workers mm. from the UK who, who, who actually managed to control oh. the entire country of India, which is ridiculous, of mm. course. Which oh. is ridiculous. But. That is just a matter of divide and rule. Mm. Uh, basically, you give them a carrot and you have the stick that once they start to revolt against you, they're probably, the, the, the colonialist country has the superior means to, to, to actually win a war. Mm. So the threat of war is the stick and the, the carrot is actually basically, mm. well, uh, 
if we play nice, I will give you some advantages. <coughs> so they, they let the local rulers keep yeah. their position in, but as long as they mm. pledge alliance to the um, to, to the empire, to the British Empire. He's, to <coughs> he's talking about like uh, South Africa. They have two phases of colonialization. Mm. First phase from the, not the British. Right, Portuguese and, Portuguese. and, and, yeah, and those people, with many people uh, moved to South Africa for they uh, start to for farming, right? Mm. Uh, that's the Br that that was more the Dutch and the British. Uh, the, I think the, the when he was talking about the Portuguese, um, basically Africa was not so interesting at that time. It was mm -hmm. more uh, necessary for the for the Europeans who were on their way to Southeast Asia for the spices. Oh. That, that's where the money was. But at that time, why uh, European <coughs> people uh, first colonialization period? Why those European people moving to Africa? Uh, basically, because they needed to get for, for living. No, no. Well, but actually, it was to put fresh food fresh and food. drinking water on the ships that would pass the Cape of Good Hope on the way to. But South many Asia. people lived there. Quite a few people lived there, but not that many. But they were just living in the in the uh, 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 around the ocean near Cape of Good Hope. Uh, there were farmers there, but it was not that. Of big scale, it was not like they were trying to control it. They just set up some farms there, and they grew their products. And they would put, they would, they would uh, provide them to the ships mm -hmm. that were passing them. Because those, it, it took a long time to get from Europe to Southeast Asia. And if you didn't have fresh fruit, for example, you get something like in the Netherlands we call it schuurbuik. Uh, people would actually get diseases because they didn't have enough vitamin C, so they needed fresh produce. That's why, uh, after they would pass South Africa, it would take a long time before they reached India, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so they needed <coughs> to actually restock. So they needed to have a place where they could go ashore safely and they could actually get some new stock. So there were some farmers that were put there, and they were they would just grow their food and, and make their money, uh, just growing the local produce. Now, that were that was the Dutch, uh, the Dutch people who m moved there initially. Then later on, the British came and they wanted to colonialize South Africa. They wanted to establish their their influence there. Uh, so the Boeren, uh, which is the Dutch, Boer. the, yeah, the Boeren. That's that just means no uh, the, 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 the the in Dutch farmers, Boeren. They fought against the British, but the British eventually, eventually won. Mm. So it is a lot of um, management, and I know you're very <laughs> you're very interested in, in in how come they managed to control it so well. It is really by uh, having this the superior technology, um, uh, having the superior means also. Like uh, the economic uh, imperialism is very important, um, and very important role uh, uh, why a lot of countries actually uh, manage to destabilize. So first, you win the war, then you. Uh, try to control the country that you conquered as efficient as possible through divide and rule. Uh, you collaborate with the leaders who do not have such deep pockets and uh, because there is only a well a smaller group who is effectively controlling the entire country um, uh, then they also have less potential to actually do that very well. Um, they, therefore, when they get in trouble, you bail them out and you take uh, control over all the natural resources and actually further, more, further extend your power. Mm. Okay. Mm. Alright, so that's the process of, of um, colonialization. It, uh, it uh, has shaped the world as, 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 as we know it. Um, it's, um, uh, it, it gives uh, strong relations ties still today uh, between England and the rest of the Commonwealth. Uh, France still has access, uh, the Netherlands has access in, in Indonesia. I, I remember you were working for, uh, for Vespa or something, for a, a, a Dutch-led company in Indonesia. Uh, we're still there, um, but they're we're not... Still, a uh, they're strong. Now it's true. Through connection with uh, 
Dutch country, Dutch people. They hire a lot of Dutch experienced people. And they also they uh, Shell is there, and uh, they have a uh, they are um, uh, exploiting a lot of these it's oil resources. So colonial still after colonialization, uh, many people try to connect with former uh, colonial uh, colonial countries. Right. Right. Well, also remember that the people who were in power during the colonial age, they were all educated in the country uh, who colonialized them. So it's still Viet Vietnam IT company very welcome uh, French people coming to Vietnam. Right, but a lot of people from Vietnam have actually been educated in Paris and in the top universities. In but uh, now Vietnamese speak uh, English, not French, right? Right, right. Uh, well, I've, I have never been to Vietnam. I hope to change that. Right, Takashi, Vietnamese the people uh, uh, did not speak French, right? Uh, sorry? <laughs> In uh, Vietnam, do people speak French uh -huh. or English? Um, still, yes, some educated person uh, was speak from French, French. Mm -hmm. French. but maybe after, after the, the Vietnamese was some person uh, the fred to U.S. then was educated in U.S. and now coming back. Right, right, right. Okay. So they have the some, yeah, connection with French, Russian, and U.S. Right. And of course China. Ah, Russian, of course. Mm. Oh, China. They speak Chinese. Mm. So they're really global people then. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. Oh. With connections in China, Russia, United States, Russia? and France. Russia? Vietnamese can speak Russia. Yeah, the some process was educated in Russia. Really? Hmm. Mm. Uh, I I would like to have uh, uh, give you the question. Uh, northern part of the Vietnamese could speak uh, Chinese, but I think uh, southern part of the Chinese uh, Vietnamese couldn't speak uh, Chinese, isn't it? Um, most of the the Vietnamese mm. don't speak Chinese. Oh. But some Chinese are living like Vietnamese. Mm. They change the name to Vietnamese. Oh. Then no spot is yeah is close to the, the border with the China. Mm. So these persons are more in Hanoi, but in Ho Chi Minh there is Chinese town. Um, they immigrated mainly from Taiwanese at uh, Taiwan. Oh. So it's different, but yes, still Chinese in South. Oh, okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah, many time Taiwanese. Mm. Yeah, I know that. Hmm. Okay. okay. Move. All right. Do you have another one, right? Yes. So this is how we develop the colonies. Since the special oh, position no, of a representative. No, 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 no. <laughs> Right. So why Europe? Because Europe had industrial era. Uh, they had a long history of war. Um, actually, uh, industrial uh, industrialization. They have the means. Uh, disease guns, armed ships, especially in the in the in the U.S. It's established that most of the Indians were not killed through warfare, but uh, but through disease. Um, Hmm. Uh, it is until you, you actually feel there's still some influence of in, in terms of um, the business behavior some um, like some the idea of doing some business in farmer uh, colonial Colonies. countries. Um, 
honestly, I don't feel that is so much true in the colonies like Indonesia. It's still to some extent true in, um, in, uh, uh, for example, um, the um, uh, more colonies that were held until more recently, like in the in the case of the Netherlands, that is, uh, Suriname uh, was the mm. colony of the Netherlands, and um, one of the reasons why there's still a very strong ties between uh, Suriname and the Netherlands is because we have a lot of immigrants from Suriname, mm. and uh, these people. Um, they came to the Netherlands when they were young, usually as students or, or, in, uh, or, or well, at least young people came to the Netherlands. They have grown up and they still uh, uh, maintained their ties with their uh, motherland. <coughs> and uh, uh, that is a good bridge uh, to establish business relationships uh, with those countries. Uh, so, yes, I think... I feel that there are still some ties, but they are growing obsolete rather rapidly. By the way, mm. many uh, Indonesian uh, try to go into uh, Netherlands for education. Um, actually, a lot of Indonesians who went to the Netherlands, uh, the, yes, sure, there were people from Indonesia who came to the Netherlands. Not in that large numbers but uh, actually a lot came to the Netherlands after Indonesia became independent because they basically collaborated with uh, the Dutch rulers uh, they held preferential after positions yes after independence they felt yeah well especially the people from Molokka uh, they came uh, in large numbers to the Netherlands not to settle there but to actually um, to, to, to stay there uh, uh, only temporary, but they they always aim to go back and and claim the land that was promised to them by the Dutch rulers, and of course they never delivered on that because they didn't have the power to actually force Indonesia to actually hand over the island of Molokka uh, to, um, uh, to 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 the uh, uh, to the Molok people. It's very interesting, like uh, Algeria in Africa. Mm. And uh, French people very much uh, repression made repression to Algeria. Right, but they, but still the French were Algerian in in Paris. Hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, the Algerian not only in Paris, everywhere. Everywhere. Oh. So even if they repression and uh, they stressed very much, but still Algerian people like to study French. Right. Um, well, yeah, that, that's true. There's a lot of uh, immigrant uh, immigrants in. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, not only colonializing you know, relationship, but also they have uh, they had human network. Hmm. That ma major reason is stay building human network. But there is also a very good bridge between Algeria and uh, France. Not only did a million French people live in Algeria at the time, hmm. a lot. But also, uh, there are so many uh, Algerian uh, immigrants, it's very easy for Algerians to come to France because they always have family or friends who already live there, who can help them to get settled, get started, maybe help them to get a job, to go up. So the opportunities for them uh, in France are very often much better than they are in Algeria because of the, weaker, the much weaker economic uh, uh, conditions uh, over there. Mm. So a lot of... Uh, uh, Algerians, for them it's a no-brainer. How about the Harvard America? Is many Filipino living in America? Filipino, yes. But uh, do they, they hate America? Hmm. A lot of Filipinos hate Americans. <laughs> yeah, killed, killed them uh, a yeah. hundred years ago. But they like America. Many people, Filipino like America. But a lot of Japanese like America too. <laughs> Uh, because because this is very exception uh, exemption because this is Japanese cases war, war guilt information change Japanese people thinking up thinking way hmm. eliminate you know uh, post World War Two hundred percent eliminate uh, hmm. mem from mem their memory hmm. right right but it's strange actually <laughs> but they, don't you think it's strange <laughs> they don't they never thinking about atomic bomb they never thinking about uh, Tokyo Airway. 
They, mm. they don't care about that. It's very strange. <laughs> it really is. I think it's really strange. It's a very heavy successful story of a world the information pro program, American military implemented. It took us, it, I think it took us until around 1980-1985 until we gradually, it was for 40 years, until we gradually, really, <coughs> with our entire heart, started to forgive the no. Germans for invading. German is different, German is different, German is, but Japan is, uh, they have no education for the uh, history, mm. modern history, nobody knows modern history. That is the reason why I wrote a book to add that in the Japanese spirit, right? Mm. Mm. Or uh, how to retrospect or what to... But are you seriously saying that young people today do not know anything about the atomic bomb? And, uh, and no, they don't know that. They know that atomic bomb, but uh, uh, they don't uh, criticize American you know, uh, people. Why not? If you, if you know about the atomic bomb, why... This is a very strong education. <coughs> and uh, but how was it explained then in, in Japanese schools that, that why the atomic bomb okay, was thrown? Okay, this is Japanese military was so bad. Mm. That's the reason why the Americans tried to stop war, so they dropped the atomic bomb. The same way, American the education for them, in the, in the States, they the same way, education system for but the American then, people. Then, Japanese, young Japanese people must think like, okay, and then when they when they look at that whole time and and, and then <laughs> yes, history, they, right. they must realize that. But wait a minute, the, the war was already over, basically. Okay, just just thinking about that, American government, how they going to teach their American children? World War Two is uh, dropping an atomic bomb. What is the legitimacy? Mm. Sort of things. Right. How they going to teach them? Exactly the same way, American people force them to force Japanese people to teach the same way. Okay, the same logic. Mm -hmm. And the, the Japanese teachers, why, why did they teach them? Because Japanese teachers are left-wing people. And left-wing people is why they teach like the same way. American way is right-wing, right? But Japanese right. left-wing. But left-wing people is at, that, at the end of World War II. Those left-wing is extreme left-wing. Mm. Okay, just the teachers association. But they sy sympathized with Russia, right? Yeah, the yeah, USSR, yeah. not exactly, with America. Exactly. So, uh, the Japanese will going to occupy the USSR in soon. So, their education is very much <coughs> the American strategy, American po policy. Mm. So, they try to, they try not to teach the truth. Very important for them. But this continues for the past 70 years. Mm. Okay? They neglect the national anthem. They neglect the Japanese flag. So things continue past 70 years. So this is... So it's guilt, right? It's guilt. Yeah, this so, is... A, uh, yeah. Did you know the Tokyo trial? Mm, Nobody yes. knows that. Huh? What do you mean? <laughs> Tokyo trial. <laughs> you can find it everywhere on no. the internet, like everywhere. Don't, don't believe it. Okay, just you can have a YouTube. Hmm. You can soon recognize this is left side, or wing side, right side. Right, but there is just, I mean, that, that you can just see the live progression of, of, no, of no, as no, it was recorded. It's very difficult to find out neutral, neutral material in Japanese. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. That, that's possible. But English is very easy, to neutral, many neutral mm. materials, but Japanese people don't understand English. Mm. So that's the reason I written my material based upon English material. English material is a lot of neutral material. But you, you only need to apply a little bit of thinking to actually start to realize, like, okay, well, really, the, 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 the throwing the atomic bomb was absolutely not necessary uh, to stop the war. That was absolutely uncalled for. So I don't understand why. I, I, I really believe that a lot of Japanese people must feel the same way. Then, then why? Do you know how the American government teach American student, why uh, the atom bomb is needed for Japan? Do you know why? Do you know that, that how the method of teaching to Japanese American people? Mm. They exactly the same way that they are, they are Japanese government teaching for student. Mm. Okay, legitimacy. Right, but but a lot of the current young generation, they must that that they, they, they are not being taught. About okay, my good example is before World War II, everybody, every family 
uh, every parent force children to teach them analect Confucius, mm. memorize. Mm. Okay, and uh, this is a uh, uh, moral mm. education. Mm. Very strong education is we force them to study, and also we had uh, uh, some uh, Japanese, you know, just Confucius theories, force them to study. Mm. But after a while, to stop everything, just only the, all this is memorizing. The okay. second is uh, <coughs> uh, uh, calculation. Calculation is we try to. Also, I studied for the uh, what that what the name of the abacus. Abacus. I forced them to study abacus and uh, calligraphy. Mm. And uh, we had three memorized abacus calligraphy. This is before World War II. Three of those is mandatory. So mm. when I'm get get year old, year, year old, three years old, parents forced them to memorize analect. Mm. This is moral. Mm. But only moral is truncated because of American force them to more give the information program. <coughs> so Japanese is very much easy to influence by outside power, especially for white people. I don't know why, but completely disappeared. Yeah, but if you, if you, uh, I mean, I can't even, why, why? So, and then after World War II and for decades and decades, government uh, denied no, it memory. Must, it must be deeper than that, Unison, because if you really look at history, then you, you cannot avoid but asking yourself, was this really necessary? Why did this happen? So, why or is that question not asked? So, is is the is that is the only? It was it enough to just eradicate this from the history books, or or or, or is there something else going on? Does oh. it go deeper than that? Okay, Japanese people is very interesting people, nationality people. What interesting is that they they no discussion, no debate, no thinking deeply for the specific issues. Mm. They just receive what they say. This is culture. Accept. Yeah. But Accept people. everything. Mm. So very very strange culture they have. That reason we going to we can have difficulty with foreigners. We, we are we going to join G7? Hundred uh, percent for sure. He cannot involve with those people because. Just, you know, he can't speak out opinion. Mm. We don't have a habit against your opinion, or just only the ugly everything. So sort of things, just this is our custom, our, our culture. Right. right. Later on, we will have a look at what happened in the 60s and where basically everything is questioned. Um, we already had, had a question, a history in Europe of critical thinking, so, but especially in the 1960s, we question everything as it exists around us, as, as a response to World War II, as a response to the Cold War, as a response to the, to, to the war in Vietnam. Uh, uh, the, 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 the 1960s generation uh, really <coughs> questions everything. And really? Uh, yeah. Japanese? No, not Japanese. Oh, you mean German? German, German American, French, Dutch, everywhere. Not Japanese. Exactly. I think that's that's very big, big difference between um, Japanese culture and European culture because we had that in Western in in, in Western world we had this this 1960s flower power uh, hippie movement that and and those people who were young then are our leaders today so they are used to critical thinking questioning everything uh, not taking things for granted and uh, and uh, the, actually a, a general dislike of dogma this is a big major reason because is American uh, wagyu to not Wogil, the American government forced them to study the TQC, mm. TQM, mm. do you know that? Mm. Total quality management. Yeah, mm. so this one is um, sort of try to focus on small issues. Mm. Don't think large, you know. Right. So, so that is completely different. That's exactly the opposite of what's happening, for example, in France during the student revolt, where there is talk about completely. Uh, rebuilding society from the ground up with the most wild and, and, and unrealistic ideas ever but 
still, it it is a time where people feel free to to question everything. And this is this is the the generation, for example, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton. They they are uh, famous exponents of uh, the the hippie generation. Um, the Japanese, we don't have Obama kind. was was after came Japanese. Out. We don't have kind of you know uh, history. All right. Always American teach us is you try to stick into small things, then small things keep doing small things. Right. Then finally you're going to get success instead of global aspect or perspective. Well, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a an attitude of contribution contribution to. Uh, I think we we in the West have a tendency to want to be leaders to want to want to be the, the the people who make change I think that if you want to achieve anything you need to get at the top of the pyramid that's kind of our, our attitude where in Japan if you want to achieve something you need to contribute because you cannot achieve it by yourself you 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 achieve it by um, by by contributing I show you this one. Oh yeah this is what this is from your book yeah I show this one hmm. American teach all those things. Revenge, reform, revive. What this means? You don't think about global aspect. Mm. You should not understand foreigners. You just only focus on your culture. Okay? And you just uh, uh, try to dig into the digital issues. You don't need concern about strategic mind. Mm. Right? So the things they force them to teach us. So, de-industrialization, this one, de-industrialization, this is as possible as they, they try to do is they focus on small issues. They never believe uh, the Japanese were going to get success, economic success at that time. But they were also part of the Marshall Plan, weren't they? No, this Marshall Plan is different. This Marshall Plan is uh, only survive. Mm -hmm. right? But unfortunately, um, Japanese people work very work hard very worked hard mm. and then finally you get success but it was not i mean i think it was not it was in the best interest of the united states that, that happened because they were a loyal ally of the united states and especially an ally at the at, in asia that was very unstable and unpredictable it, it, if there was one one very loyal partner in asia it was japan no 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 they, they just you don't still you don't understand they are still very skeptical for Japanese militarization, even now. Well, maybe now, but at the time of the Cold War, they were very happy with uh, Japan. Uh, no, as still an no, ally. still they just uh, just very skeptical for Japanese uh, militarization. They know that the Japanese uh, power, so they try to uh, control their. But uh, I mean, at, during the Cold War time, you're either with us. Or you're against us, and and Japan was clearly. You know, this is uh, two faces. Mm. Two faces. Mm. Mm. Very strong. America know very well Japanese people uh, because uh, World War Two, mm. and they Japanese have has potential power. They know that. Mm. They try to how to manage their power, mm. and American uh, desire is suitable power. Okay. Hmm. And uh, appropriate power. Okay, they want to. Do so they, they build up like a strong a ally. Nuclear nuclearization. They don't like it. Japan will going to change drastically. They know that. Okay, they whenever they are going to change to dragon, they are going to change the, the, some big animal monster. The, the monster. They know that. Godzilla. Right. So they know that how to control Japan. This is they are still very much thinking hmm. issue. So a strong ally, yeah. but not, not, don't, not too strong that they can turn their back. Exactly, so the, this is kind of, you know, uh, their attitude for Japan. What's that screen, sports and sex? Sex is a very good tool for the, uh, reduce their uh, focus on the, the, the doing something like a, uh, economy or, or something in activity. Sex is more, uh, like uh, minus aspect they are expecting for the encourage doing sex business, so they try to like a uh, uh, opium, not opium, but uh, like a similar to opium strategy, 
uh, to China before. Mm. That's the same. Mm. They encourage sex business, mm. so Japanese people unwillingly to doing doing something, activity, more focus on sex mm. and sports and movies, and so they just enjoy, entertain instead of working hard. But unfortunately, the Japanese people working so hard. So that that big major threat for American people. How come they got success? Mm. It's unbelievable, you know, because uh, this this industrialization. How come they got power? Decentralization, but actually more centralized, mm. right? Mm. So this is a Japanese kind of things. They they change their attitude, but 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 Japan people still they don't have any strategic mind. They don't doubt American, you know, uh, military action for against us. Japanese people no doubt for them, mm. and also they try to educate it and. Uh, Memorize is very important for education, but eliminate any kind of memorize mm. from Japan. Still now, is the uh, Japanese government don't like memorize. Memorize. This is most important thing. Neither do we. No, no, we no. Glo memorize. Global level is uh, very much memorized activity. It, you know, uh, even if they can read a character, but uh, every people is try to force them to memorize. And Chinese very strong memorizing activity there. Mm. But yeah. I, I think that, well, it has changed. My parents, my parents were educated. With the, the education system was very much uh, emphasizing memorization. Uh, my mother can still name all the islands in, of Indonesia, for example, by by from the top <laughs> of her head. So she, she, it was really crammed into into her uh, education system. And we, we, uh, I don't think that that ninety five percent. Do you know why important memorize is? I just involved in some memorize association before. Mm. Why important? And why? in Japan uh, before World War Two, three years old, and the children memorize analect all analect, mm. and he got to get uh, thirty years away, age of years old. They started fifteen years, sixteen years. They started to study the analect, but he already memorized every book mm. from first page to last end. Then he got to know, oh, I know every pages. Mm. What this means is, uh, is the uh, analect kind of analect is, uh, is the uh, Confucius is kind of sort of, you know, not reading book. Mm. All those analect is uh, whole the way li of life. He just gets to study morality. Right, but it's the same thing like, uh, for example, p people in the Middle East studying uh, Quran. Uh, Quran. This is the same, mm. exactly. So. Middle East people is uh, they study Quran, so we study uh, Bible. Eh? Yes, that, so the younger people very well mor how they have morality. Mm. You know that uh, Islam, Islamist is very strong morality they have. But actually, so when children study this kind of information, it's information, do you know that, right? Do you know they force them to memorize the Quran, Quran. Right, right, right. Do you know right. That? Yeah, 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 yeah. Same yeah, thing. Yeah. The, uh, Chinese people. I have two Chinese, uh, my family, you know, they... Jewish, Jewish people, they... They, they force yeah, them to yeah. memorize yeah. Analect. Yeah. Analect right. and also the, the more, one more, two, two books. But what is... I mean, uh, okay, it, it doesn't hurt, but what is the real benefit of a three-year-old okay. or five-year-old? This is, this is simple. Dignity. Mm. Getting old, are uh, you follow on the Analect? Mm. She memorized everything. Right. Yes. Does father. he understand it? Yes, father. <coughs> Do you understand it? Yes. Yes. After after fifteen years old, before fifteen years old, they do not understand. Just only memorize. Right. And the, from the first book at the, at the at the end of the book, and ten thousand characters, they, he memorized everything. Right. Quran, same. Memorize. Right. And you can say he can speak out, but he does not know what that it mean. Exactly. But parent, he don't care. Just memorize. Mm -hmm. Then after fifteen years old. He can understand at school, okay? At school, uh, he's going teacher to teaching you, but every student, I know this sentence, I know this word, right? But I didn't know the meaning. Now he's going to right. say, right? This is this is how we the same as Quran. Mm. Quran is getting old. They now he get to understand what this means. That the reason they have very much morality they have. Right. Morality means what is this? Okay, just go. Your back is straight, spine straight. And uh, you're going to, are you going to ask question? 
he going to answer for me with morality. This is dignity. Mm. So, okay, parallel. Uh, nothing to do with the Bible, but uh, as a kid, you hear songs, on, kid, six on, the radio, songs on the radio. The show. Recently, you Dutch people don't go to church, so they, no. can, they don't memorize the Bible, but the people who are there are not memorized. We don't the memorize Bible. anything. Basically, There's a lot of memory, so they get getting grow, growing up. They know. <laughs> I, I remember I had to study German uh, German uh, vocabulary. Oh. I hated it, so I, I what is, what is morality? They terrible school. The Chinese people, certain level of Chinese family, they my 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 children, everybody force them to memorize. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Mother force them to do that, and they memorize. They getting growing growing up. They just they, they have to. Go. Right. So when when I was a kid, I listened to the radios, and there were songs in English, English <coughs> songs that I that I like. So I started to mimic the words. But of course, <laughs> it was b gibberish. It was b nonsense. Not, it, it not, was, not, not, but not. but once you you go to school and you start to learn English, you you all of a sudden realize, oh, what I was singing was wrong. It was it was actually this. And then you actually learn it. You kind of understand and learn and memorize much quicker because you, even oh, though okay I tell you now is I'm teaching uh, Takashi the Confucius okay mm. my book is Confucius Japanese spirit but this is every time I teaching him is is not easy mm. not easy to memorize right mm. so but getting older is not easy no but I we, know I we should study mm. and if you're going to study it and Japan we're going to have a uh, sort of you know, pride, sort of dignity, uh, sort of even if Japanese people don't have money, but we can communicate with Asian people. Currently, why Asian people expect uh, ja Japanese people to be present in Asia? But uh, uh, Takashi knows that many Asian people, uh, they cannot find that any you know, uh, respectful Japanese. Mm. Who's respectful Japanese? Before World War II, we have many respectful Japanese. In Asia Pacific, try to make an effort to communicate with local people, mm. but not now. Many Japanese people are going to overseas just with chasing money. Mm. And first of all, he go, he want to go to start to talk with money. No kidding, this is you should study Confucius. Mm. So, but you know, very difficult to study the Confucius. It's uh, because it's not easy, mm. not e easy, right? This is what I'm talking about now. Okay, this is what I'm t teaching now. Today's the issue that I'm teaching, <laughs> teaching now. <laughs> okay, go ahead. All right, so we were talking about uh, colonialization, so let's move on to decolonialization. What is this? Uh, this is also J J John Green. John Green. Hey, uh, honey, can you look at this? Does this sound like me? Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and today we're going to talk about decolonization. The empires European states formed in the 19th century proved about as stable and long-lasting as Genghis Khan's, leading to so many of the nation-states we know and love today. Yes, I'm looking at you, Burundi. Would you ever know your what the fuck is it? Burundi. everything? Burundi. Oh, Burundi. Stan, don't come to the Burundi. intro. I sing like an angel. <coughs> yeah, that's a violation. <laughs> Burundi, next to Rwanda, actually. Rwanda. So unless you're over 60, and let's face it, Internet, you're not, you've only ever known a world of nation-states. But as we've seen from Egypt to Alexander the Great, to China, to Rome, to the Mongols, who for once are not the exception here, to the Ottomans and the Americas, empire has long been the dominant way we've organized ourselves politically, or at least the way that other people have organized us. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, so to them, Star Wars would have been like a completely different movie. Most of them would have been like, go empire, crush those rebels. Yeah, also they'd be like, what is this screen that displays crisp moving images of events that are not currently occurring? Also, not to get off topic, but you never learn what happens after the rebel victory in Star Wars. And as we've learned from the French Revolution to the Arab Spring, revolution is often the easy part. I mean, you think destroying a Death Star is hard? Try negotiating a trade treaty with 
Gungans. Right, anyway, so the late 20th century was not the first time that empires disintegrated. Rome comes to mind, also the Persians, and of course the American Revolution ended one kind of European imperial experiment. But in all those cases, empires struck back. <laughs> you see what I did there? I mean, Britain lost its 13 colonies, but later controlled half of Africa and all of India. And what makes the recent decolonization so special is that at least so far, no empires have emerged to replace the ones that fell. And this was largely due to World War II, because on some level, the Allies were fighting to stop not Nazi imperialism. Hitler wanted to take over Central Europe and Africa and probably the Middle East, and the Allied defeat of the Nazis discredited the whole idea of empire. So the English, French, and Americans couldn't very well say to the colonial troops who'd fought alongside them, thank you so much for helping us to thwart Germany's imperialistic ambitions as a reward please hand in your rifle and return to your state of subjugation. Plus, most of the big colonial powers, especially France, Britain, and Japan, had been significantly weakened by World War II, by which I mean that large swaths of them look like this. So post-war decolonization happened all over the place. The British colony that had once been India became three independent nations. By the way, is this Gandhi or is this Ben Kingsley playing Gandhi? In Southeast Asia, French Indochina became Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam, and the Dutch East Indies became Indonesia. But of course, when we think about decolonization, we mostly think about Africa going from this to this. So we're going to oversimplify here because we have to, but decolonization throughout Afro-Eurasia had some similar characteristics. Because it occurred in the context of the Cold War, many of these new nations had to choose between socialist and capitalist influences, which shaped their futures. While many of these new countries eventually adopted some form of democracy, the road there was often rocky. Also, decolonization often involved violence, usually the overthrow of colonial elites. For now, let's turn to the most famous non-violent decolonization, or supposedly so anyway, that of India. So the story begins more or less in 1885 with the founding of the Indian National Congress. Congress party leaders and other nationalists in India were usually from the elite classes. Initially, they didn't even demand independence from Britain, but they were interested in creating a modern Indian nation rather than a return to some ancient pre-colonial form, possibly because India was, and is, hugely diverse and really only unified into a single state when under imperial rule by one group or another, whether the Mauryans, the Guptas, the Mughals, or the British. Okay, let's go to the thought bubble. The best known Indian nationalist, Mohandas K. Gandhi, was a fascinating character, a British educated lawyer born to a wealthy family. He's known for making his own clothes, his long fasts, and his battles to alleviate poverty, improve the rights of women, and achieve a unified Indian independence from Britain. In terms of decolonization, he stands out for his use of nonviolence and his linking it to a somewhat mythologized view of Indian history. I mean, after all, there's plenty of violence in India's past and in its heroic epics, but Gandhi managed to harken back to a past that used nonviolence to bring change. Gandhi and his compatriot Jawaharlal Nehru believed that a single India could continue to be ruled by Indian elites and somehow transcend the tension between the country's Hindu majority and its sizable Muslim minority. In this, they were less practical than their contemporaries. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the leader of the Muslim League, who felt, to quote historian Ainsley Embry, that the unified India of which the Congress spoke was an artificial one, created and maintained by British bayonets. Jinnah proved correct, and in 1947, when the British left, their Indian colony was partitioned into the modern state of India and West and East Pakistan, the latter of which became Bangladesh in 1971. While it's easy to congratulate both the British and the Indian governments on an orderly and non-violent transfer of power, the reality of partition was neither orderly nor non-violent. About 12 million people were displaced as Hindus in Pakistan moved to India and Muslims in India moved to Pakistan. As people left their homes, sometimes unwillingly, there was violence, and all told, as many as half a million people were killed, more than died in the bloody Indonesian battle for independence. So while it's true that the massive protests that forced Britain to end its colonization of India were non-violent, the emergence of the independent states involved really wasn't. <laughs> Thanks, Bob Bubble. All this violence devastated Gandhi, whose lengthy and repeated hunger strikes to end violence had mixed results, and who was eventually assassinated by a Hindu nationalist who felt that Gandhi was too sympathetic to Muslims. Oh, it's time for the open letter? An open letter to hunger strikers. But first, let's see what's in the secret compartment today. A cupcake? Stan, this just seems cruel. These are from Meredith the intern to celebrate Maribration, the holiday she invented to celebrate the anniversary of her singleness. Dear hunger strikers, you remember earlier when I said that Gandhi harkened back to a mythologized Indian past? Well, it turns out that hunger striking in India 
going back all the way to like the 5th century BCE. Hunger strikes have been used around the world, including British and American suffragettes who hunger struck to get the vote. And in pre-Christian Ireland, when you felt wronged by someone, it was common practice to sit on their doorstep and hunger strike until your grievance was addressed. And sometimes it even works. I really admire you hunger strikers, but I lack the courage of your convictions. Also, this is an amazing cupcake. <laughs> Since independence, India has largely been a success story, although we will talk about the complexity of India's emerging global capitalism next week. For now, though, let's travel east to Indonesia, a huge nation of over 13,000 islands that has largely been ignored here on Crash Course World History due to our long-standing bias against islands. Like, we haven't even mentioned Greenland on this show. The Greenlanders, of course, haven't complained because... So the Dutch exploited their <coughs> island colonies with the system of Kulterstessel, in which all peasants had to set aside one-fifth of their land to grow cash crops for export to the Netherlands. This accounted for 25% of the total Dutch national budget, and it explains why they have all kinds of fancy buildings despite technically living underwater. They're like sea monkeys. This system was rather less popular in Indonesia, and the Dutch didn't offer much in exchange. They couldn't even defend their colony from the Japanese, who occupied it for most of World War II, during which time the Japanese furthered the cause of Indonesian national nationalism by placing native Indonesians in more prominent positions of power, including Sukarno, who became Indonesia's first prime minister. After the war, the Dutch, with British help, tried to hold on to their Indonesian colonies with so-called police actions, which went on for more than four years before Indonesia finally won its independence in 1950. Over in the French colonies of Indochina, so-called because they were neither Indian nor Chinese, things were even more violent. The end of colonization was disastrous in Cambodia, where the 17-year reign of Noradam Sihanouk gave way to the rise of the Khmer Rouge, which massacred a stunning 21% of Cambodia's population between 1975 and 1979. In Vietnam, the French fought communist-led nationalists, especially Ho Chi Minh, from almost the moment World War II ended until 1954, when the French were defeated. And then the Americans heard that there was a land war available in Asia, so they quickly took over from the French, and communists did not fully control Vietnam until 1975. Despite still being ostensibly communist, Vietnam now manufactures all kinds of stuff that we like in America, especially sneakers. More about that that next week too, but now to Egypt. You'll remember that Egypt bankrupted itself in the 19th century trying to industrialize and ever since had been ruled by an Egyptian king who took his orders from the British. So while technically Egypt had been independent since 1922, it was very dependent independence. But that changed in the 1950s when the king was overthrown by the army. The army commander who led that coup was Gamal Abdel Nasser, who proved brilliant at playing the US and the USSR off each other to the benefit of Egypt. Nasser's was a largely secular nationalism and he and his successor saw one of the other anti-imperialistic nationalist forces in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, as a threat. So once in power, Nasser and the army banned the Muslim Brotherhood, forcing it underground where it would disappear and never become an issue again. Wait, what's that? Really? And finally, let's turn to Central and Southern Africa. One of the most problematic legacies of colonialism was its geography. Colonial boundaries became redefined as the borders of new nation states, even where those boundaries were arbitrary or, in some cases, pernicious. The best known example is in Rwanda, where two very different tribes, the Hutu and the Tutsis, were combined into one nation. But more generally, the colonizers' focus on value extraction really hurt these new nations. Europeans claimed to bring civilization and economic development to their colonies, but this economic development focused solely on building infrastructure to get resources and export them. Now, whether European powers deliberately sabotage development in Africa is a hot-button topic we're going to stay well away from, but this much is inarguably true. When the Europeans left, African nations did not have the institutions necessary to thrive in the post-war industrial world. They had very few schools, for instance, and even fewer universities. Like when the Congo achieved independence from Belgium in 1960, there were 16 Congolese college graduates in a nation of 14 million people. Also, in many of these new countries, the traditional elites had been undermined by imperialism. Most Europeans didn't rule their African possessions directly, but rather through the proxies of local rulers. And once Europeans left, those local rulers, the upper classes, were seen as illegitimate collaborators. And this meant that a new group of rulers had to rise up to take their place, often with very little experience in governance. I mean, Zimbabwe's long-serving dictator Robert Mugabe was a high school teacher. Let that be a lesson to you. Your teachers may have 
have dictatorial ambitions. But most strong men have emerged, of course, from the military. Joseph Mobutu seized power in the Congo, which he held from 1965 until his death in 1997. Idi Amin was military dictator of Uganda from 1971 to 1979. Muammar Gaddafi ruled Libya from 1977 until 2011. The list goes on, but I don't want to give you the wrong impression about Africa. Because while the continent does have less freedom and lower levels of development than other regions in the world, many African nations show strong and consistent signs of growth despite the challenges of decolonization. Botswana, for instance, has gone from 70% literacy to 85% in the past 15 years and has seen steady GDP growth over 5%. Benin's economy has grown in each of the past 12 years, which is better than Europe or the US can say. In 2002, Kenya's life expectancy was 47. Today, it's 63. Ethiopia's per capita GDP has doubled over the past 10 years, and Mauritania has seen its infant mortality rate fall by more than 40%. Now this progress is spotty and fragile, but it's important to note that these nations have existed, on average, about 13 years less than my dad. Of course, past experience with the fall of empires hasn't given us much cause for hope, but many citizens of these new nations are seeing real progress. That said, disaster might work around the corner. It's hard to say. I mean, now more than ever, we're trying to tell the story of humans from inside the story of humans. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week. Crash Course is produced in... So, basically, decolonization was triggered by World War II, uh, where uh, the, the colonialist empires that had to work together with the locals to fight off um, the enemies, like uh, uh, Indochina, Indonesia, um, basically, uh, that, that World War II uh, triggered a... Um, a change in the balance of power in the case of Indonesia um, and uh, uh, basically it started the, the, the cause of independence which took different routes different shapes and forms um, but uh, it was uh, uh, it, it was the start then uh, another important factor that uh, that was there is that basically the world the Western world was very much divided in the, during the Cold War era and that contributed uh, actually for uh, local like, uh, colonialist uh, uh, rulers or p people who wanted to uh, get the colonialists out to sympathize or to work together, collaborate with uh, the other side um, so uh, they could get support from either Russia or the United States and further their, uh, uh, their cause for, uh, for, for independence. Um, so it's uh, um, the Cold War helped to de de decolonialize uh, uh, these uh, these countries, um, but yeah, decolonization <coughs> actually uh, 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 resulted not in instant success because uh, because of the, the during the colonialist rule, um, the institutions in these countries had not been developed. They all dependent were all dependent on on their uh, colonialist uh, rulers and. After they left, uh, it was difficult to replace them and uh, and and get uh, uh, get the right <coughs> legal structure, uh, the right educational uh, institutions to uh, to become successful. Furthermore, uh, people were forced in countries that were not really countries before the uh, the, the the colonies were started. So uh, some countries were designed. Um, uh, they were, were, were not well designed to become stable. Uh, we we talked about Sykes Pico uh, last uh, last time, um, but there are a lot of other examples. Uh, for example, Rwanda is, uh, is is an example that was uh, was mentioned here, and a lot of other countries um, that uh, that that are very diverse and do not really function well as a nation uh, because of the diversity from from within. So uh, that basically triggered decolonial mainly in Africa tribal conflict. Right, right. Well, if you go to Africa, if you go and you ask people, um, at least that was uh, twenty, thirty years ago, if you ask people where they are from, they wouldn't say Kenya, for example. They would say I'm Luo, uh, which is their tribe. Uh, so they they would they would identify much more with their tribe than with their country.
and uh, uh, that's that's how it has always uh, always been and and it and that's also what has been amplified uh, during the colonial rule because certain tribes were given certain advant advantages over others if they uh, got uh, on the right side of the colonialist uh, uh, rulers hmm. so that uh, yeah that didn't really help these countries to rebuild very quickly after uh, uh, the, the, the British left. Mm. How do you think about uh, Japanese under World War II, <coughs> Japanese organized Asian country to unify? They had uh, several meetings mm. in Tokyo, mm. uh, great Asian unification kind of organization they created. Did, did you study something about that? No, I didn't, and I'm actually a little bit surprised because wasn't the intention of Japan to, I mean, f to stay in these countries for a longer period of time? No, this is a. Uh, I studied uh, the uh, uh, Great East, Great Asian, East Asian War. Uh -huh. okay? I studied, I wrote a book. And then I get to know. I didn't written down this kind of association, unification, organization. I didn't talking about anything at all. But uh, recently I recognized this is uh, this organization is based upon Japanese uh, traditional culture. Mm. Japanese people are not individual. Mm. Always they thinking about society, village, country, Asia Pacific world. Always they are thinking of uh, everything about as group. Mm. Right? You know In a that? circle. Yeah, a circle. Do you yeah. Know that? yeah. But Westerners is individual. So uh, colonialization is mainly based upon individualistic. Right. Okay? And we and you. Okay, we invade you. Yeah. This is my asset, not your asset. Right. But Japanese, they don't speak as I. Mm. They don't speak out. Always they're talking they don't, about... They literally don't speak out I. No? I no, they're so. talking about we. Right. Every time. Right. And those Japanese, they don't think about this is my asset. This is my my belonging. No, they don't talking about that. This is our asset. Mm. So this is a, a thinking approach. The Confucius is like the best upon kind of sort of think, sort of thinking approach. Mm. And Japanese philosoph philosophy is the same, same way. They don't have uh, I or you or he, like uh, uh, Nietzsche or like uh, the Dutch the philosophy. You and I and you and our heaven, mm. but we don't have a kind of concept unified. Mm. Okay, mm. not I, not you, <coughs> unified. Mm. Understand each other, get together. It's a kind of approach we have. Mm. So this is based upon that culture Japanese try to do in kind of organize Asia Pacific countries. This is my do recently I gradually understand. It. But when so what was the objective? Independence or or part of the uh, Japanese <coughs> Empire? This is strange Japanese strange thing. They have no intention. Mm -hmm. Japanese people always, but Westerners always thinking about colonization. We try to invade. We try to get asset. We try to mineral gold and mine and dam. But Japanese never do that in the history. In the history, Japanese people never do that. So how do you explain Manchuria? This is Manchuria is uh, just is this is uh, basically this is actually they try to uh, through colonialization and Chosen is colonialization. Right. Chosen and Manchuria is they, why they do that because they try to. <coughs> uh, Similar, similar to Westerners, they studied from British, they studied from America, so they try to follow on their colonialization. Mm. Simply, they try to uh, the colonialization. Right. Exactly. This is try to invade. Right. Right. Manchuria and Chosen and Taiwan the same. Mm. Taiwan, Chosen, Manchuria is uh, pure colonialization because they try to. Well, they want to do like uh, British people. They want to do like American people. Mm. American government regime. They did okay. Japanese want, wanted to do that. Mm. Very simple. Simple. They try to, you know, uh, show them in the world. Mm. Uh, America also. They want to get the Philippines. 
they want to get something from Hawaii and because the uh, European people they did. And Japanese people same way. <laughs> this is the era of this colonization. Hmm. Imperialism. This is imperialism. Right. But after but that how how <laughs> about for example then the, you, you, you talked about the the League of, of Nations or, or, or yeah, after that, okay, nineteen forties we don't we don't understand they they are not intention for colonialization in Southeast Asia. No intention for colonialization. So what was the plan? Why why did they go to Indonesia? Why did they go to Malaysia? Why this is a very interesting. Uh, why why did this is Japanese is uh, inertia. So inertia. Okay, mm. just uh, okay. Try to try to occupy the Pacific Ocean. Mm. And try to occupy the Southeast Asia to try to try to reach out to India because of the enemy. They got no way to expand their territory. But actually, the uh, the people living in Asia Pacific, mm. actually the Japanese government, they are not not any kind of intention to do that. Then what what they doing there? I don't know. Just the Japanese typical characteristics is try to expand everything. But then, and then, what they want to do? I don't know. They don't have no intention. Reaching out, then, what? What's your intention? You stop it, but they they could cannot. But but my my concern is uh, not ex expansion. Okay, expansion is 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 otherwise is the other meaning of Japanese try to expand whatever any kind. But uh, the other issue is. What their intention for Asia Pacific people? Mm. What is their true intention for Asia Pacific people? Okay, just occupy, okay, mm. and uh, dominant, invaded. Then what they thought about that is uh, their thinking approach is not like a colonialization, not like they didn't, didn't take the same way of European people did. Different. So what did they want? So resources or no, no resources. So what they did is uh, finally they thought about, okay, you guys try to unify everybody, cooperation each other. This is what they did 1942, 1943. This is recently my understanding. Uh, mm. no, they have nothing, you know, kind of uh, try to get resources, uh, try to get some money or try to get some, you know, labor force, everything. No, nothing. They just only try to unify. Well, yeah, because it, it doesn't really make sense because they, they really tried, for example, to get into Burma, get get a connection between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific <coughs> Ocean because of food uh, shortage and 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 and, and resources. Do you but, know but Burma? Why, what they no, were okay, doing? This is a good way? good question. As the, it's uh, invading Burma. Right. What they did? They did nothing. They are they are soldiers, labor uh, uh, of life. Is the same as exactly the same as local people. Mm. Not more than that. But uh, British Dutch is uh, soldiers level is you know just uh, big differences. Mm. Big gap. Barracks is better than Japan is the same as local people living very poor, very poor food and uh, nothing, no intention. But I really I I, see, I, I cannot wrap my <laughs> mind around it because. <laughs> what? Why, how come they did? They didn't have so any this objective. Is, this, this is this is this is what I'm recently. How come they are no objective? Okay, Burma Railway. They want to invade India, right? Right. But they but they, they uh, needed to get. That's to right. That's right. But this is a military intention. Right. But uh, this is absurd. But anyway, but actually, they, how they going to handle Burma people? How they going to handle uh, the Indian in Indonesian people, Philippine people? Nothing. What they did for past who gave the who gave the orders to uh, to even attack Indonesia, for example? Oh, this is a Japanese another characteristic. They try to expand territory at that time. But were, were the were the generals under tight control from 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 Tokyo or what? what uh, were, were they head operating of, Tokyo independently? Tokyo had to go to just invade it, to take it, and uh, Indonesia, Philippines. And Malay is just only the couple of months they occupied. But, after but they that, did it because they could, or because they wanted. They could. Oh, that's the only. Only, only couple of months. Then, then after that, several years. 
they are so peaceful. Mm. Do you know that? So peaceful. Mm. Philippines, Indonesia, Malay, Singapore, Hong Kong, except China. So peaceful. Mm. Nothing happened. Mm. What are they doing? I don't know. And they finally, the Japanese government is trying to ask them to organize local countries to, to prepare for independence. And uh, the Japanese government tried because to. Because they probably have already understood that they, they, there is no way that they could keep an empire like that intact. No, no, not the empire. This is a different. This is purely based on Japanese in, indignant, indignant culture. Not, not, this is not my country. This is not my mm. kind of approach. They try to do in spread to Asia Pacific. Vietnam, the same. But Manchuria is an is invasion. But Manchuria is an uh, invasion. Right. But, uh, but, no, but okay, they had a know, very clear objective uh, for that. Yeah, no. But what they're talking about for Manchuria, do you know that? They try to cooperation with uh, Han, Han people mm. and the Mongol people mm. and Japanese people. And five people they try to cope. Right, but they also the Manchuria flag is five nation, mm. five nationality and one flag. And uh, Manchuria is very peaceful, mm. very peaceful and uh, very well organized. Invaded, but they established the country anyway. Right, but it, Korea is different. But they had an objective there. I mean, it I, exactly. This is Japanese way to. They try to similar way like British did. American did, European people did, but uh, not kind of sort of image of invasion. Yeah, but not not even like it was not really a matter of like for most of our colonies, it was a matter of extortion, uh, like getting all the resources out. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was more building up a livelihood. They don't, they people, don't. no, just, they, just they, they, they don't. get yeah. new land to yeah. live and farm yeah. and and basically develop a yeah. new country, a new uh, yeah, and extend it. Chosen is that they chosen is they did similar. Similar way to police because they, they, I think they, 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 they believed that, that Japan was get, getting too crowded, so that they they wanted to. Oh, Chosen did the same way they did. Labans around. Yeah, yeah. Chosen, yeah, Chosen is Labans exactly the same, and uh, they try to get uh, thirty-seven land from Chosen people, and uh, Japanese people uh, farmers, okay, moving to Chosen, mm. and uh, try to very similar way. To, um, French, British way people did. Right, but that's exactly. But, but Man Manchuria, they, they is different. It's mm. different. They are not kind of sort of, sort of concept of the invasion. No, it's like, but it's like uh, what uh, what the Netherlands did when they sent people to Australia to start farms there, or or to Canada to start farming there, to to buy land and to basically to build up a new existence. Um, it's. Basically, spreading. But do you know that in Africa, still um, uh, French, they have uh, still uh, they have lot uh, asset in Africa, and uh, they have uh, I, I forget that thirty five percent of GDP came from Africa. Plus mm. power, mm. they have still influence for many countries because before independence, they have asset there, so still continue the mm. asset, right? Them go. It's like they try to French people still. They are uh, similar, similar, similarization, assimilation, assimilation, assimilation. Right. But still, they are doing that kind of invasion concept. They have, but uh, Japanese people, they don't know. So the special. Chosen, I understand. Ka Ka Korea, Chosen. I understand. Like like Manchuria, I understand. But I don't understand what was the point of going to Indonesia. What was the point of going to Malaysia? What was the point? Why? Exactly. So currently, just after writing that book, actually, Indonesia, but Ch China. What was the point of going to China? Oh, China is actually China is a very strong country, right? Okay, and Japanese tried to invade China, but they couldn't. Why? China is strong. Yes. Okay, but oh, they they wanted to take. Okay, the so China is battle more than ten years, over land battle. But why? For hegemony or why? Just uh, they try to this kind of try to make a invade that country, 
but you can be scared of a country. That doesn't mean you need to invade it. Like I mean, uh, invade it, they just try to occupy Shanghai, occupy Beijing, and uh, they to make the to first punch. Otherwise, you will be punished. Something like that. Yeah, the, but I tell you, Japanese uh, military, they occupied Shanghai, but never won. Hmm. And uh, actually, that was war, right? Hmm. And uh, they are uh, uh, they going to the Vietnam, military going to Vietnam, but on the way down to the Vietnam, everybody the enemy, hmm. and immediately occupied uh, going down to the south end and immediately going back to the Shanghai because so risky because all area is enemy. Hmm. Anytime military is beaten by local military people, hmm. they couldn't win. Was that the reason why they occupied it, so that they can actually have ships going in and out for it, for getting oil in, or no, what, what no, was it? No, 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 nothing. Then I really don't understand. I really don't right. understand. <laughs> Me neither. So this is Japanese character. Okay, Japanese people. This is uh, they try to invade, but uh, why? Why are you want to go to Vietnam? Kimoto-san, help us. Why? <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> Why? Well, yeah, so this is, uh, what Vietnam, Japanese, Indonesia, China, why? China, China and Vietnam, why Japanese expand their territory under the World War II? But my opinion is they ja Japanese character is uh, they, they try to beat enemy, right? That ex extend their territory, but still extend at most, but still Japanese couldn't want. So extending and Asia Pacific and the Pacific Ocean and uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, but Finally, they couldn't win because they were still trying to expand it. Right? And China is finally they couldn't win. But after occupied, it's the Japanese, Indonesia, for example, Indonesia for more than three years, the, the peaceful year, yes. But why? What are they doing there? I, I, I'm, I'm told him, nothing. Just the Philippines, a peaceful three years. Malay, three years. Vietnam, three years. But what are they doing there? But no, nothing. Just, just. Uh, Occupied doing well with local people, but what what purpose? My understanding, many people misunderstanding. This is uh, they are doing World War Two, and the Great Asia, Asia, Asia East, East East Asia War, and after war, no 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 no, war is only China. Okay, any country is not war. Actually, the peaceful years, three years. What what is they doing there? No 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 nothing. Just uh, uh, only stay there. Nothing else. So Japanese government decided, if you're going to stay, Japanese people occupy there and stay in there. Why not cooperate with each other, try to unify and peaceful? This is kind of Japanese culture. I I I recently understand, but Sonoda said, and they favor Philippine people, favor for Japanese. No kidding, Japanese killed Philippine people. How come Philippine people, they like zero fighters, they, they like Japanese people? No kidding, I told him, but actually they like they like Japanese people on the whole. Do they, they like Japanese people, hate American people? Because World War II, thinking about World War II, Philippine, Japanese occupation, they have nothing to worry about, nothing in hate for Japanese people. Of, of course, uh, of course, comfort women they have, okay? this is kind of, sort of bad image they have, but uh, usually, Nothing, no, no bad thing. Just only live there. Okay, Manila. Okay, occupied after Manila. Japanese people occupied Manila for three years. Very peaceful three years. Nothing wrong. Jakarta, nothing wrong. They did any bad thing. Japanese people have dignity and they have pride. Japanese very pride for local people. Nothing wrong. They don't do anything. Only Singapore. They killed many Chinese, yes. 70,000. Okay? Mm. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew almost killed. And they only, because, uh, because you know, this is uh, one reason, because headquarters is uh, Tsuji Masanobu, he's one of the crazy guy. Kill all Chinese, mm. he ordered. So they killed 70,000. <coughs> but any other place, nothing happened. Malay? Oh no, nothing happened. They just only that. Because the uh, local people and Japanese soldiers uh, left for level standard. Exactly, exactly the same. They eat same food. Okay, not British, not Dutch, not American. They eat same food, say, same house, same barrack. They live there. 
who is the same as local people. Mm. Right? It completely doesn't make sense to me. You, you doesn't make sense, right? But no. actually, actually, this is a, uh, uh, before World War II education it disappeared, everything disappeared. Nobody educated, okay? Nobody knows that. Mm. We tried to eliminate every his, history before World War II. But I wanted to study that. But what, okay, what benefits would, would, would that right? like if, if we can exactly. think about it, like, okay, is, is it is resources? Usually the answer is, lies in resources, right? Is, is, are there certain resources that they wanted to get from Indonesia, like oil or something like that? Okay, Was oil is a different issue. They wanted to, actually, they could find that they couldn't get oil anyway. Mm. Because Japanese ships couldn't come down to Indonesia. Okay? Mm. Couldn't come down to Indonesia. On just only half a year or something. Okay. Short time period, but actually they couldn't get any oil. But the uh, original their expectation is they want to get oil from Indonesia. Mm. So they couldn't get, but they stay there for three years. What their objective? They don't do anything. Peaceful days. Oh, they can uh, carry the Indonesia food back and forth to Japan. No, no. American submarines. Mm. They can do that. Mm. So. They had very heavy battles. Basically with, uh, stuck. Yeah. They had very severe battle at uh, Papua New Guinea. Mm. At that old area, many people, 10, 10, few, 10, 10, 1,000, 1,000 people dead there. Okay? No battle, dead there. Mm. No food. Mm. Okay? They tried to bring food from Japan, but a, any kind of ship was sunk by somebody. Mm -hmm. So they dead many people. I, I've been there, some Laval uh, or some other area. In the been there too. I saw Nagaisan also of Nag uh, Nagaisan Na, uh, Senju. Hi, so so so. so, so. He oh. been there. Yeah. But uh, he must meet with uh, many womb. Womb. Right. Right. Oh my God! He stayed there. Unbelievable. They have a lot of womb. <laughs> womb. Worms. Worms. Right. And uh, it's a uh, lot of small animals. Yeah. It's, uh, Impossible to live there. I, I stayed in <laughs> hotel uh, several days there. Terrible. In hotel is many places warm. Huh? Yeah. I can I can sleep there. But uh, he went there. He he stayed there under tent. Mm. So unbelievable. Mm. But anyway, so so what? So you know, they went. They stayed and then they went home. Philippines, but mm. Philippines is a good example. Mm. None of Filipino, okay, actually the Filipino people is 100 million people, but none of the Filipino people, they, those people not hate us. Uh, even if World War II, they like us. Well, I mean, basically what they had before, the Americans were worse, a lot worse. worse. But yeah. also, I tell you, most, you know, uh, worse, just like uh, worst, worst occupation is Singapore, okay? Mm. Japanese military, Tsuji Masanobu killed many Chinese, and uh, most bad, Marriage for the Singapore, but Singaporeans, the best people, most like people for Japanese in, in Asia Pacific. Why? I just, I was uh, so spectacle. How come Singaporean people like Japan? Mm. In the best in the not Asia. Chinese? No, 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 including Chinese. No, the best Singaporean. No Chinese. Mm. They like Japanese people. Why? Because Japanese occupation is they. They treat Singaporean as a human being. Mm. How about the British? No, they didn't treat tr treat the, those people as as they treated as animal. Mm. Okay, never treated as human being. <laughs> he is she responded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Google. Google. Yeah. Mm. Go Google. Mm. <laughs> she will respond. Go Google. Go Google? No, something different world. Google? Uh, it's a different world. I don't but anyway, <coughs> okay, this is uh, my... I, I, it, it doesn't make sense, but I, I told Sonoda, you don't tell a lie. How come Philippines is like a zero fighter? They have some special memorial zero fighter, you know, in, mm. in, in Philippines. Mm -hmm. But he just uh, respect uh, Philippines, respect Japanese soldiers. And that one would say, but no kidding, why are they telling a lie? But I told him, but I studied the Philippines, this is a fact. Mm. They liked us, but uh, that it means for three years, uh, the occupation is very peaceful. Mm. 
あのノットライカーアメリカのオキュペーションノットライカーブリティッシュオキュペーションオキュペーションのユージュアルオキュペーションはジャパニーズピープルノットオキュパイドで、で、try to manage あのデリケートリスポンスビリティフォーローカルピープルあんだなすなすんびゃんじゃあコリア朝鮮は違う朝鮮は切る many people Okay, beat many people So I don't know why I don't know why, but 朝鮮 is still now is、uh, they try to hate Korean people.、Mm. I don't know why.、Mm. My wife is half Korean, but she told she, she, she can speak Korean because、uh, it is discriminated until now. I don't know why.、Mm. But Chinese is no, because Japanese never won Chinese.、Mm. Asian people, Japanese have any discrimination for Asian people. Okay?、Uh, this is the, ミステリーミステリーオッケーアイティンカージャパンハザアベリーハピーノットゥハバスレイブアヒストリーインジャパンインジャパンアーザーズノスレイブアーインジャパンアーフォーザーロングヒストリーバッユーロピアンピポフォーザーロンアンデグリスグリックハザー Slave culture、mm. uh, because, especially,、uh, occupied into the,、uh, country was uh, uh, export to、uh, many, many uh, slaves. Uh, therefore, the, therefore, Japanese people do not know how to manage slave people. <laughs> therefore, Japanese people uh, treat uh, uh, local people <laughs> as a friend. <laughs> only b a d t h i n g is.、Uh, mm. Dutch, Dutch woman is、uh, almost all Dutch woman as a comfort woman.、Mm. Because、no. the Japanese people never touch white, white woman. Not so, many, not so many. I don't think but, it was.、Uh, but mm. So they, the Japanese uh, senior uh, officials, they try to、uh, handle those people.、Okay? So、this is the only bad、uh, point in the World War II. The other thing is.、Uh, A、China case is、uh, many people said, okay, just rape killing. Of course, doing war. Doing war. And、uh, half a million people, soldiers going from Shanghai to South, always they are threat, they are killed. Many people, Japanese soldiers killed anyway. And those Japanese soldiers killed、uh, Chinese soldiers, farmers, and women. Everything on the way to going down to the South. Because they can live on which one the enemy, which one the soldier. Even the farmers, everyone is an enemy. So, who were they fighting? They were fighting the Allied forces. So, the Allied、China? forces. No, no, Japan. Japan was fighting with Britain.、Uh, oh, in Asia? In Asia, yeah. So, fighting with Britain, with Britain. the Americans. Britain, not America. Well, Asia Pacific is America. Right, America. But、uh, East, East Asia is British. Right, British, French,、uh, French Dutch. But not French. French is 1945. Until 1945,、uh, the, just BC is、uh, right, collaborating, collaborating with, the, with Japan.、Yeah. So, but that is,、uh, no, no, that, that is after but, World but, War II. But Japan also,、uh, they, they invaded Indochina, right? They invaded yeah, but India. actually, the, the battle is only the British at India. In Asia Pacific, no, no battle. And finally, the Americans come back to the Philippines. Then,、uh, the 1945, the battle for, battle for America. So, no battle means that basically France handed over Vietnam to yeah, Japan? Yeah, yeah.、Mm -hmm. Very peaceful.、Mm -hmm. So, this is what I, I, I just I need to study for kind of Japanese culture and character. It's kind of, it's, it's, uh, uh, America tried to, tried to take back the Philippines. If they didn't try to back the Philippines,、mm. the same peaceful years continued. Nothing happened.、Mm. No intentions. Right? So this is my this kind of decolonization,、mm. decolonization.、Mm. Japanese are actually, they are.、Uh, Try to like the United States of America, they try to experience colonization.、Mm. They later come up. Right? In bad cases, right. chosen. 
Exactly, they call like each other. Mm. Right. right. Taiwan is different. Taiwan is a uh, is, uh, peaceful occupation. Mm. Right? As you know. How, how was, uh, how was uh, uh, Manchuria? Manchuria is, uh, okay, Manchuria is, is the Japanese people invaded Manchuria. Right. But why they don't have big problem? Because it's Manchuria is huge population there. Mm. Many people don't live there. Mm. So very easy to occupy. Right. And just simply. And the Japanese uh, intention is invasion. Try to make a territory, Japanese territory. This is actually colonization, but colonization is usually colonization. Uh, you, usually, you have uh, people, okay. Chinese people live there, but that is no Chinese there, mm. Manchuria, mm. Manchuria people there, but very few. Mm. So no, no problem. They occupy that area. Okay, and Japanese government a lot of investment for building <coughs> industry. So. Even even if there are few people, are they happy for living there? And even if uh, many people colonize there or living moving Japanese family moving there, mm. no 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 you know, kind of you know, uh, discrimination there. Mm. And very peaceful you know, people they are living there. This is much Chosen is different. <coughs> so. so but Japanese people never studied uh, the kind of uh, this war, what what they did before. But I don't know why why government don't teach them. Yeah. Why they not preparing material? This is one reason is uh, maybe Japanese teachers association left wing. Yeah. They don't want to give them uh, <coughs> teach. What okay, is stupid question. So, but why did they actually go to war against the United States? This is a good question, yes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Japanese people is like that. Okay. My opinion is even now oh. even now Japanese people don't know outside Japan. Oh. Okay? Japanese people hate Trump but uh, they can make judgment who he is. Because uh news source is very limited. <coughs> I think uh English material will go, support to be translated only less than ten people for the news media. Oh. So they, everybody, the common information they have, mm. very few information. So they don't understand Amer America. They don't understand Merkel, they don't understand Putin. Because uh, Japanese news media is also, also there. Kimoto told me, just, just left wing. Mm. And uh, they are not neutral. So this is always the same as uh, before World War II. They, Japanese people, they don't know the truth. So uh, if that kind of situation going on 10 years later, maybe Japan will go into battle against some other country because they don't know. Mm. Before World War II, they don't know what happened in the world. But what makes them go to war? I mean, what Yeah, it, it is credible, incredible. At that time, before World War II, Japanese people, they uh, believed the Japanese win against America. But, 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 but even you, then, why? Why? For what? This is uh, okay. Just kind of Japanese people, very, uh, very uh, good characteristic. They, 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 very much influenced by big boys. Mm. Okay, just uh, headquarter, Japanese headquarter of military announced. Because Japan was not being threatened by the U. Well, okay, they, they, they were at the side of the the of Germany oh, okay. and, 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 and at that time they said. Uh, we we are uh, shortage of oil. Mm. America embargo everything. Right? This America is the most bad country. And they prohibit to do everything else. The Japanese cannot survive. Mm. Right? So this is a major reason. Mm. But this is a lie, actually a lie. Also America is uh, they they uh, okay, we are supposed to ask to discard uh, Chinese, you know, invasion. If the Japanese military stop invading China, mm. maybe America try to stop the kind of you know, embargo. Mm. But Japanese uh, don't want to discard their territory in Beijing and Shanghai. Mm -hmm. right? Not Manchuria. Manchuria is everybody accepted. But uh, 
because at that time colonialized, not every country tried to do that. But uh, Japanese military, they didn't. So they tried to uh, make a pro propaganda for Japanese people. Uh, they, uh, uh, American government, you know, forced us to uh, wage a war, mm. right? So Japanese tried to do something against them. Right. But why military decide to wage war? This is uh, another. But that was uh, already uh, okay. You mean when? <coughs> when they when they invaded China or when they? No 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 no. And uh, China is uh, okay. Is uh, one reason why the Japanese military invaded China. Okay. Mm. But this is useless war. That's common sense. They cannot win the war against mm. China. Right. <laughs> Huge country. Right. But uh, how come they invaded China? But this is well, just Hitler just thought that he could conquer Russia. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Napoleon yeah, already yeah, failed. Same, Hitler failed. Same, same. It's the same. It's so the ba it's basically kind, mm. kind of you know, um, instinct, mm. instinct, military instinct. Mm. Just only the, the purpose is only for invading. Right. Try to get territory, right? Mm. And uh, against America, it's the same. Why? Territory, but no, yeah. but why, why they started to the waging war against America? But because at that time Japanese people they can't speak English, they only very limited information, and people always everything happened, people's movement, mm. right? Mm. So people's movement is uh, the military forced them to thinking they are the way of thinking. So they uh, follow on military opinion instead of government opinion or mm. instead of common sense. But this is ridiculous. They, 100% for sure, they couldn't win. If going to get information about uh, American materials, American economy, GDP, so mm. forth. And uh, this is uh, nonsense, right? But they, at that time, they didn't know that. Was it? But it's it's strange. Like, but was it maybe? I, I don't know. But was it maybe really because uh, these generals wanted to make a career for themselves? Career. Career. Because Ca career. 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 Just in, the, in like individual in the individual motive to actually start a war to lead the army to conquer parts of China just be because you can. It is easy. The Japanese military conceal the fact of the uh, Japanese people. Um, but even what did the mili military gain by invasion? I mean, just to get more power for the military? <coughs> yeah. But the military was loyal to the emperor, right? So it was not like they could get more power because the emperor was still there, so they would never be able to get more power. Oh, well, this is a kind of the uh, system of the American election system, same. Okay, Trump, why Trump is coming out of president? Hmm. This is a pitfall of the American democracy system. Mm. Okay, they couldn't avoid uh, the, the Trump. They, they, they couldn't exclude <laughs> stupid people from same, voting. Same, same, same <laughs> for Japanese, you know, the system is very risky. And at that time, Japanese system is we try to, uh, to try to control military. Mm. And emperor, no, he cannot speak out uh, the military, speak out opinion. It's a kind of system. So the, at that time, no way to control the Mm. This is a uh, move in this direction. Mm. Okay, but recently I tell you, and uh, recently I'm studying America, why Trump is, uh, what what kind of action he's trying try to make for Canada, try to uh, make uh, Mexico. I'm studying that, but he's not so bad. Really? Yeah. Mm. And uh, because you know, because he's supported by Republican, it means why Republicans supporting him? Okay. If he's a crazy guy, mm. only he is dictatorship, mm. and he's uh, trying to uh, jail all journalists, mm. no, he don't do that, right? Mm. So you need a more serene, calmly thinking about what he said, what he does. Mm. He's a typical person of bad woman. His character is bad woman, okay? Mm. Like my wife, bad woman, bad wife. He's, uh, she's 70%, uh, she's talking about rising, but 30% screaming. 
クレイジーシーン、バッネグレクサティパーセント、バッセブンティパーセント、シーズテスピシフィギュアドライシーン、ユニットリスンセブンティパーセント、バッサティパーセント、ジャスト、ワンイヤーとアナダー、ライト、ソトランプイズ、エグザクティセン、ヒーズ、ライク、カナディアン、メタル、アンスティール、エンバーゴ、ウォー、ウォー、ジャスト、ヘビータクス、バッ、ヒルゴン、チェンジ、ヒーズ、マイン、ウィズ、カップ、マンセス、バッ、バッ、トルド、ヒーズ、ビリーブ、ザ、The Trump's opinion, he takes seriously t a k e the American. Yeah, sure, he takes no, it seriously. No, 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 no. You know, okay, I, I can recommend Trudeau.、Yeah. Wait a minute, he's going to change his mind within a couple of months. Just wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute, just you service that your employees will still arm him. Just wait and see.、Yeah. He's going to change his mind because woman, bad woman, okay, bad woman, the bad woman, the typical bad wife, is saying, if you're going to opinion, Against her, she never l i s t e n Discrepancy, no, she never b e l i e v e me. Why, husband, you don't never you don't listen to my opinion? I'm right, she's crazy, okay, but I'm right, okay, just you're right, okay. I tell you, so I tell what you're you saying is that Trump is a bitch, not not bitch. Well, look, a, a, a woman, right? Like, a, a don't say bitch. Woman. <laughs> Never say my wife bitch. You know? ah, I, 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 I'm turning around the face into my friend. Oh, she's bitch. <laughs> but I never tell. But fa- Facebook, Trump,、uh, face, Facebook I told my wife is bitch.、Um, she told because she told me.、Uh, husband, I never,、uh, I never see Facebook anymore.、Mm-hmm. I don't like Facebook. And I believe her.、Oh. But she always t a k e my Facebook and s h e listening up. Oh, she's bitch. <laughs> so she just g i v e me the list. Oh, you told me so serious word for me, right? Oh my God. But anyway, Trump is the right kind of person. Right. <laughs> okay, so Molon and bitch, idiot, everybody talking about. But this is 30%. 30% of his, he's talking about. Well, I would say 70%. But,、uh, By the way, 70%, 30%, but I don't care. But、mm. 30%, 70%, he's the right, right opinion he's speaking. But must be careful, listen. But this kind of, you know, yeah, but I tell you, okay, because Xi Jinping, Chinese can select the world.、Mm. These Chinese people do that. This is because of his history, because many people, many、uh, discrepancies, many people live there, so they try to select the world. And these Cra- people. Crazy.、Uh, uh, do you mind if I、uh, close it for a little? And also, they are, they are, they are, okay, cool. And, and then, and do you know why Abe is、uh, support him, Trump? And North Korea, that they're going to stop the meeting with she,、uh, Kim Jong un.、Mm. Abe sent a <coughs> call, sent mail immediately, I support you.、Mm. No comment, I support you.、Mm. Then he changed his mind, well, we're going to meet with Kim Jong un. And then immediately he sent mail, I, I support you. you. <laughs> do you know why? Do you know why? No. I understand. I, I didn't understand how come he, this Abe is a crazy guy. You know?、mm. How come? What do you mean? What, what silly opinion? You should speak out you know, Japan support for、mm. uh, South Korea, Japan coordinate with,、uh, with China, and、uh, we're going to do something. So, North Korean people live in Japan. We're going to do something for you. He never s a y Abe is、uh, abused that uh, 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 Trump is his wife. No, his wife is a bad wife.、Mm. Mm. Do you know that?、Mm. His wife is a bad wife. He knows how to handle bad wife.、Mm. So now he knows how to handle Trump.、Mm. Same.、Mm. He does know that.、Mm. No opinion. If you're going to get opinion for his wife, his wife gets mad.、Mm. Son of a bitch, husband.、Mm. Disappear, get away from here. She will tell him, right? He knows that. If he's going to speak out something for Trump, he going, Trump will going to tell him. Get out of here.、Mm. Exactly the same word he wants to speak up. Okay? He's a typical bad wife. He's a man? No, no, he's a bad woman.、Mm. If you can't understand he's a bad woman, very easy to how to handle him. Okay, he's a honest, op- right opinion, and speak u p just、uh, serene and calmly listen to him.、Mm. Oh, this is his right opinion. Okay, just follow him. And this is she's a bad woman, he's crazy, and no, don't say any opinion for him. Never listen to you. Right? This is Trump. By the way, okay, let's <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah, let's go back.、Uh, sh- sh- can I get you a cup of coffee?
No, you go ahead. Yeah? Oh. Uh, no, I don't need. I, I'd rather have a coffee. Uh, she needs hot a coffee, hot. I think. Hot coffee? Hot coffee. You don't no, want no, anything? No. Are you sure? No, no, I don't have it. You still have it, but okay, it's cold. It's okay. No, okay. You, you're ah. going to get? Okay. So, just coffee, 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 あ、やっぱり。やっぱり。やっぱり疲れる。疲れる。ちょっともう午前中疲れる。Of course. I'll be right back.